Okay, so my, my name's uh, Philip Cardiff. I'm an associate professor in University College Dublin in Ireland. Um, and this training is on solids for foam. Um, so I'll spend some time of it going through some slides and then I'll spend a little bit of time in the terminal. I guess it's not really long enough that I expect you to follow along. It's more something maybe you can refer back to if you want to follow along in terms of like doing it yourself. Uh, I was repairing the battery for my laptop this week. Uh, so this is my wife's laptop. So, so far it's working okay. Uh, apart from the fact there's only one port on it. So hopefully my battery doesn't need to be charged. Uh, and I think you can hear online. I'll try keep an eye on the uh, questions. Okay, there from the last time. People are saying great talk. Um, so yeah, just <laughs> feel free, uh, people in the room, you can interrupt uh, if you have a question and on online, you can just ask. Um, okay, I'll just start with uh, salts for foam. What, why, how? So what is it? Um, why, is, why am I developing it? And then how exactly is it being developed at a very high level? So in short, salts for foam is a Open foam toolbox for computational solid dynamics and fluid solid interaction. So it's all open foam code and it's to do solid mechanics simulations and fluid solid interaction simulations. That's what it is. So for example, um, <coughs> a lot of my research, some of it is related to metal forming, some metal forming companies. So this is like a verification test case for large elastoplastic deformations with frictional contact, things like that. So this is a tutorial you can do. Um, you can also do this one, which we're going to look at. So this is just dam break. It's just the standard interphone dam break, except we just stick, make the dam flexible and then we run it. So we have a little elastic like rubber dam. So the fluids hit it and it bounces around. So this is one of the tutorials in salsa foam that you can try. So salsa foam is not the only way to do FSI in open foam. So there are a variety of different ways with different relative merits. Why does salsa foam exist? So um, generally, many people, probably many of you here have a desire to do FSI problems. So fluid solid or fluid structure interaction uh, problems. Um, so this is one way to do that. I had the same desire. And um, also people may want to do solid mechanics or FSI natively in open foam. So it's quite a lot of investment to learn how to use open foam, understand what an open foam case is and run open foam. So then if you want to do an FSI, well, one approach is you can learn uh, Phoenix or FE Bio or one of the many open source finite element softwares out there. But then it's basically like learning the whole thing again, like a whole new wheel you have to learn. It may be better, but maybe it, since you already know what an open foam case is, if you could just do it in open foam, that would be uh, convenient for some people. And also the idea of a modular approach. So some of the earlier FSI stuff, I released the solver and it's an open foam under solid mechanics called ICO FSI non-lin elastic UL foam. So that's, it's basically kicking ICO foam with a particular type of solid formulation and just putting them in one open foam solver so you can run it. So then I wanted to change it from ICO foam to pimple foam. So then I'd have to make pimple FSI ICO blah, 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 blah. So that's a real pain in the ass for code duplication. Code duplication is not a good thing in coding. So you don't want to duplicate code. So this modular approach, you'll see how solver foam doesn't follow the design of open foam from the solver perspective. It has a different solver design perspective to minimize code duplication. And then separately, research into finer volume methods for solid mechanics. This is more just of a, a personal interest of mine. It's, it has some curious um, characteristics relative to finite element methods or other methods that may be beneficial in some situations. That's the why. Um, how? So the idea is if you can use open foam, then you can run an open foam case, you can run a solid foam case. Things will be where you expect them to be. Boundary conditions and initial conditions will be in the zero folder. Yeah, I'm gonna ignore that. Um, um, material properties will be in the constant folder. You can change the time step where you expect it to be changed, et cetera. Uh, one desire is to that I can uh, support the main forks of OpenFoam. So by the main forks, essentially there's three at the moment. There's uh, openfoam.com produced by ESI and OpenCFD. There's openfoam.org by the OpenFoam Foundation, CFD Direct. Uh, and then there's Foam Extend. They're like the three main, main public forks. There are other ones as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> that is the case. 
uh, and they have some distinctions. So I try using compiler directory support so that it will compile with each of those. Should be easy to install. And uh, many people uh, develop code in their PCs or whatever as part of their research. And um, not many people are aware that OpenFOAM has a coding style. There's a page, OpenFOAM C++ style convention. They tell you what your code should look like. So this is not whether it compiles or runs correctly. This is the style. This is what it should look like. This is whether there should be a space or not after a for all loop. You might think that's absurd, but if you know what the style is, then when you see code in the same style, you can read it instantly. It's just like learning to like drink water or something or ride a bike. When you see code that's not in that style, it's much more difficult for your brain to figure out which loop corresponds, where does it close. So, okay, people say, I'll do it when it works. I want to meet this person who will change the code after it works. So, okay, single executable design. Uh, so Solves for Foam only has one solver. It's called Solves for Foam. If you open up uh, Solves for Foam solver, it's essentially just a empty wrapper class. It just says create an object of type physics model, which is a class, and then tell that to solve its equations. So it doesn't know anything about the equations. It just says there is some class called physics solve physics. That's it. So that physics can be a solid or a fluid or a fluid solid interaction case, and that's specified in the case. So this is the distinction. We have one solver and then Essentially, the real solvers are all in classes. So we have a solid model class, an FSI class, a fluid model class. So for example, um, we have like essentially like a piezo or pimple fluid, which is just take piece of foam, copy the code, and put it into a class. Now I said I hate code duplication, and this is the disadvantage of this approach. You have to copy and paste a fluid model into its own class structure. But the advantage means then I can just create that solver wherever I like, whenever I like, tell it to do what I, what I want. It's not an executable, it's a, an accessible object. So that's a fluid, and uh, the solids are the same. Um, there's very many types of solid formulations, just as there are fluids, whether it's compressible or incompressible in fluids, but it's the same idea in solids. You can have like small strain or large strain, and there's a variety of formulations and et cetera, and solution methodologies. Uh, in fluid models, a key thing for accuracy is determining what the stress in the fluid is. And that comes from the turbulence model. The equivalent in a solid is comes from what's known as the constitutive model or the mechanical model. So the whether it's an elastic material or elastoplastic, viscoelastic, coroelastic, some other plastic um, type of approach. So there's a variety of different linear elastic models, and there's also even a wrapper for abacus, fortran, subroutines as well. For FSI. There are two main approaches to FSI in the literature. There's what's known as partition methods and monolithic methods. So partition methods solve the solid, then solve the fluid, and then you may iterate. And you pass forces from the fluid to the solid to move it, and you pass the motion of the solid back to the fluid to update the mesh, and you iterate, or you don't iterate, depending on it. So that's called partition. That's nice because you can have a black box fluid, black box solid. They don't need to know about each other. There's also monolithic, which is you discretize the whole thing as one big piece of mushy fluid solid, which is not implemented, but that's on my to-do list for a long time. I just need to find someone to pay me and researchers to look at it for five years. And these slides installing OpenFOAM, I'm gonna skip over these a, a little bit because we are tight for time. You can find, if you want more, there's, uh, you'll find similar presentations I've given online on YouTube and longer presentations I've given from uh, different trainings. And so if you want to, you can find these slides on ResearchGate or, or other places if you just Google them. I'm going to upload these slides anyway after this. Um, but essentially, there's two ways to install uh, Salsa Foam. You can do it natively, which just means you download it from Git, as long as you have a version of OpenFoam. Um, so for the master branch, if you have Foam Extend 4.0, 4.1, uh, ESI's 1812, 1912, or OpenFoam 7, then the master branch will compile. Or the next release, which will be Salsa Foam 2.0 when it's released, um, but you can just use the next release branch now, compiles with these versions. You just download it, and then there's an all W make, run that, and it should just work. It should just compile. Uh, you can also download a Docker image. Yeah, so this you just navigate into the folder, run all W make, and then check the executable works. You can also use Docker. If you don't know what Docker is, it's like a lightweight virtual machine. So it's essentially just like a full computer in an image you download, and it has Ubuntu and everything set up already. Uh, so you just need to install Docker on your computer, and then you can launch a Docker terminal, and then it's all there. Um, if you use Docker, that's particularly convenient. If you don't, don't bother learning it, I guess. Okay. 
Okay, example case. So I do lots of different example cases and when I've done trainings in the past, so I just, uh, I always, each time I do a new training, I try to just update my slides just so I add to it in some way. Uh, so this one, in, since we're in Cambridge, I was trying to think of what could be cool to do with Cambridge. So Newton, obviously, uh, this is his alma mater. So I found you can find a CAD of a bust of uh, Newton online. So I downloaded it and meshed it uh, with CF mesh and added that as a tutorial. So we'll, we'll go through that now. Um, so what is it? Um, yeah, so I just assume it's rubber and I assume gravity is in this direction and I just fix the bottom. So I just start off, there's no gravity, then gravity kicks in. So the whole thing is like fixed at the bottom and it's, imagine we were holding it sideways, it just kind of falls and bounces. So the material is elastic. So that means it doesn't dissipate energy uh, in the mathematically perfect sense. So that should just keep bouncing back to position zero, down back to position zero. So converting uh, potential energy to elastic, storing it, converting back. So that should run forever. Numerical methods, the discretization may diffuse energy. It'll disappear or may explode if it adds energy or something like that. So for this, I'm using foam extent 4.1 and solid foam on the next release branch. Uh, some of the theory. Um, so this equation here is conservation of linear momentum. Uh, it's basically mass by acceleration on the left per unit volume. So this is density. Uh, displacement here, D is displacement here. So normally in solids, we don't solve for velocity. You can, but you, it's more convenient to solve for displacement normally. So the uh, derivative, the der time derivative of displacement is velocity. The right hand side, this is just divergence of stress and this is gravity. So this is for an ideal, the most simple solid, um, which is an elastic solid. So this is actually pretty similar to like a Navier Stokes. You'll have this term here and here in your uh, Navier Stokes formulations. And this would be viscosity, but it's what's known as a shear modulus here. It's like this stiffness in shearing. Uh, this right hand side term, normally you'd have grad P. So you'd have the gradient pressure. This is like a pressure term. It's just normally we, in solids, you calculate the pressure directly from the displacement or velocity field. You don't have it as an independent variable. And there's a variety of uh, solution methods that are implemented in solid foam as are available in many finite element formulations. So you can do it implicitly, explicitly. If it's implicit, you can do it segregated or buck coupled or there's lots of things you can do. So maybe it's worthwhile just uh, reviewing some of these concepts. So find a volume method. And there's two things to note if I take a typical cell. Um, the shaded area is your integration volume. That's what I'm gonna call it. So we take the equation on the bottom or any equation, partial differential equation, and we're gonna try and force that on that uh, piece of volume, that final volume, okay? That's what we're gonna do. How do we do that? Well, we're gonna write it in terms of some unknown, in this case, displacement, but it could be velocity and pressure. And the velocity and pressure at particular points. So these points here, these cell centers, um, one way we can call those the computational stencil. Sometimes they call it a computational molecule. So to enforce the equations on that volume, that area, we're gonna write this equation below in terms of the unknowns at those points there. So that's one stencil. You can have different formulations for different size stencils, but this is a typical cell centered one. So that's the stencil and the control and the integration volume. And um, just um, for comparison, there's also vertex centered finite volume methods. Not, that's not the standard in open form, even though I'll give a talk on that tomorrow um, if you were interested. So in vertex centered, typically you define a volume around a vertex. Um, so that's your uh, volume that you're enforcing the equations on. And then you do in terms of a stencil of the points around it. There's some relative merits to doing that as well. For comparison, finite element uh, method they will enforce that equation on all the elements around a node. So not just fit, they don't define a second mesh, they, def uh, they define it over all of those elements. So for that center node, they will um, enforce it over the volume of all of that red area in some weighted way. In contrast, the final volume method enforces it just over the boundary, divergence terms over the boundary of its volumes. So that, that's like, it's not a philosophical, that's an actual difference between the, the two methods. And just to note here, it's very subtle here. I should have made it a bit clearer. But if you look at a neighboring integration volume in the finite volume method, uh, they don't overlap. Whereas a neighboring one in the finite element method, they actually overlap. So you doubly or triply or multiple times integrate over the same area in the finite element method. Whereas in finite volume, it's normally integrated once per area. Does that matter? Well, that, that's where the conservativeness tends to come from. So now you conserve what goes out of one goes exactly into the other. That's not the case in finite element. It's just one average balance system. 
Uh, one other distinction is if you look at the boundary of the mesh, um, cell-centered methods don't have unknowns on the boundary, whereas vertex-centered do have unknowns on the boundary. That doesn't really matter normally, but in solid mechanics, you normally like to have unknowns on the boundary uh, in terms of writing traction conditions. So that's one disadvantage of cell-centered, but you can add face centers as unknowns as well. It's just tedious. And then just to mention implicit versus explicit, how you calculate your diversion to stress. If you calculate that in terms of an unknown displacement, you have to make a linear system, AX equals B, and solve all that. That's an implicit method. Uh, or you can just use the old time values of B. That's an explicit method. But then you're subject to uh, a current number of less than one, so you need small time sets. So you can implement both of those. If you're interested, I would say, if you want some uh, bedtime reading, you can download this uh, paper. I published this with uh, my colleague, Ismet Demirzic, last year. So it's, uh, we have 600 references on finite volume methods for solid mechanics. So if you are, inter are interested in learning more about uh, this, you can check out that paper. Okay, let's look at the case. So Wobbly-Newton. And so if you download it, you can find this Wobbly-Newton case under solids linear elasticity. And so what does the case uh, look like first? So in this case, I'm giving an example of this of a vertex centered finite volume method that's implicit. So uh, it solves for point D, which is the displacement at the points in the mesh, okay? So you would expect in zero, there's point D, that's where your initial and boundary conditions would be specified. There's only two boundaries, two patches. There's the bottom, I th think I call it base, and then there's the rest of it, I think I call it just Newton. So Newton is just like air, so that's just like zero force. There's no force on them, it's like an interface. Um, so there's a boundary condition called point solid traction. So traction is force per unit area. So you specify the, uh, a zero traction condition. On the base, I just set the value of point D. So we're in the point D file. So the value of point D will be zero. So there's no displacement. It just doesn't move. All the tutorials in solid form have an all run and all clean script. So if you go dot forward slash all run, it will run every, it, the tutorial. If you, in this case, if you open it up, it has a few commands. So it has Cartesian mesh, which is CF mesh. It's like snappy hex mesh. It's just a slightly different approach. Um, so it's a Cartesian based mesher. And um, that makes the mesh, the way I defined the patches here was just, I have a, a separate SDL. This is just the base. And I use surface to patch, which just makes a patch where that SDL is just for convenience. And that doesn't have an override option. So I have to uh, move the mesh manually. Uh, that's what these steps are just uh, with, the, with the new patch. Then it runs solid form. If I just look at the consonant system, so the only distinction between a normal open case uh, and Seltzer foam is the first thing it looks for is a physics property dictionary. So physics property here. So physics property, it's a, a dictionary that only has, it just tells it, is this a solid or a fluid or an FSI case? That's it. So you just say solid fluid or fluid solid. Fluid. If you say solid, and then it will look for solid properties. If you say fluid, it'll look for fluid properties. If you say fluid solid interaction, it'll look for FSI properties. And in that dictionary, you'll tell it about what type of solid it's gonna solve. And then once you pick that, then it's essentially picking what solver is called, is the idea. So in this case, there's a variety of solid uh, models, all solving the same equations, just different ways, implicit, explicit, or some different discreditation of those. So we're using one called vertex-centered linear geometry. Just to comment on maybe your solids people and you don't need to know this, but uh, most of you are probably are mostly from a fluids background. So in solids, um, let's say an analogy for compressible versus incompressible in fluids. So in fluids, there's incompressible compressible where they're, they're quite different like approaches to solving the problem. You might just say, well, if everything's compressible, just use a compressible approach. But then you're like, well, that won't be efficient for an incompressible problem. So in solids, there's something called geometrically nonlinear and geometrically linear. So all problems are geometrically nonlinear. And what does that mean? It means our equation, we're integrating over a volume, uh, wobbly Newton. So when I apply force, he moves, his little eye moves a little bit. And the area of that little piece of uh, infinitesimal piece of uh, surface will change. So that means if we're integrating over that on surface, it's unknown. So we're integrating over a mesh that we don't know yet. So that means solids are always inherently nonlinear because it's, that's a function of displacement, and your stress is a function of displacement. You multiply them together. However, the standard approach is just ignore the fact that mesh is a function of displacement. And that's called a geometrically linear approach. That's a, an assumption, um, and that's also known as small strain approach. So if you open up SolidWorks to do a stress analysis, they make that assumption. So that's fine if, if 
thing steel and it doesn't move that much or something like that. Not for rubber, typically. And then there's geometrically linear where you actually have a nonlinear solution procedure which accounts for that. And in this case, it's an implicit discretization. Instead of the turbulence properties, we're going to specify the uh, mechanical properties. In this case, a linear elastic. So a linear elastic is like the most simple ideal elastic material. You specify something called E, which is the Young's modulus. It's like, if you imagine the material is a spring, it's the stiffness of the spring. And nu, which is the Poisson's ratio. So that's, if you have a spring, when you pull it, solids like to kind of preserve their volume to some degree, so they'll contract in the other direction. So when I pull it this way, it'll contract. Ha 0.3 means if, if I pull by one in this direction, they'll contract by 0.3 in the other direction. So there are two, two constants to describe linear elasticity. And then we have density as well. And then we have G, which is our gravity, and applied in the Y direction. Okay, let me try this. Okay, so is that okay? At the back, you can read the text. Okay. So solves for foam. This is inside the directory. If I ls this, oh, do I have the tree command? No, I don't. So um, this is the high level uh, format of solves for foam. So it follows the open foam design of the toolbox. So you have an application folder, and uh, you have an SRC folder with the libraries, and you have two tutorials, and then some other bits and pieces like third party. So if I go into applications, solvers, it's only one solver Oops. called solves for foam. If I go inside that, open up solve for foam, uh, we can see we've included FE, CFE like normal. We've included something called a physics model. If I zoom down, there's no create fields. I just make something called a physics model. So this is uh, a type of runtime selection. So when you run the case, this decides which class it needs to create. And so I make something called physics. I have an object called physics, and I go through the time loop. The physics object may want to set the time step. I let it do that. And then there's an evolve function, which is just solve whatever equations you want to solve, whether you're a solid problem or FSI or fluid problem. Um, there's this to tell it it's the end of a time step, and then it may want to write some fields. So that's it. There's basically no real code in the solver. Okay, so if I go tutorials, inside tutorials, there's three folders, fluids, solids, and fluid solid interaction. It's not my goal to reproduce all the fluids in, in open form. That would be silly. So it's just a minimal fluid, just to show a fluid works on its own, but that's not the purpose of solid form. So uh, in the next release, there's just pimple foam, not ICO foam, piezo foam, simple foam, because they're all a subset of pimple foam. You can get the behavior of ICO foam, piezo foam, and simple foam if you just choose your settings for piezo foam, the correctors of correctors. So it goes inside solids. Inside solids, uh, there's a, the cases are broke down into different types of phenomenon or physics. The blue is probably not great there, sorry. Um, so we have different types of material behavior. And so we're going to go into linear elasticity. There's a few cases here. So wobbly Newton is down the bottom. I think I ran it uh, just with some results to store it. And so if I, if I go all run, it'll run Cartesian mesh and then surface to bash, and then it starts running solid to foam. Um, in this case, this solid vertex solver is using PET-C, which is a linear solver. So it's not using the open foam linear solver, it's using a different one. Um, so you can see it goes through the time steps. Uh, it's taking like five or six seconds per time step, writing out some things about the stress, some other things like that as well. Um, this is a transient problem. So if I open up FB schemes, uh, we have a second time derivative. We don't have that in fluids. So you can have a steady state discretization, or you can have Euler, which is first order, or backward, which is second order, or in this case, it's using a Newmark beta, which is a type of second order popular in uh, solid mechanics, I guess. Um, you don't have any divergence scheme. You have no advection term. There's no convection or advection, so that's because it's Lagrangian. So it's just like the gradient scheme is the, the key thing, essentially. So if I find this case, not that one. The Newton run. Okay, so open up the case. So in this case, I've pretty, just so the tutorial runs quickly, I have a relatively low resolution uh, version. And um, so it 
is in the spine, but you can set the mesh density to be higher if you want to see what he looks like. So his nose gets a bit smoothed. Um, okay, so I have the results in this case. Uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so for solids, if I play it, first thing you notice is, oh, it's not moving. So in this case, it's a small strain approach. So this is a conceptually people find this difficult to understand. We're assuming the mesh doesn't move and we're solving for the deformation on an unmoving mesh. So if you want to see the motion, you have to uh, use a filter. So there's warp by vector. So I'm gonna say move the mesh by the displacement field to show me what the actual deformation look, looks like. So then you can see him nodding along. So if what does it print out? So you'll have a displacement field. So I can see the tip of his head is gonna displace the most. We're saying it's zero at the bottom. So his head displaces the most. And uh, I think this is set up for three periods about point, uh, the, the period of the wave is about 0.12, I think. So he bounces about three times here. What else gets printed out? Well, you have a stress tensor with all the components, but that's not that interesting to look at all the components. So in, normally if you're designing something, uh, maybe not a bust, but uh, you look at what's known as the von Mies stress, or it's also called the equivalent stress or the von Mies stress. So it's essentially a scalar stress, which defines how likely a material is to fail. So normally if you're designing something apart in SOLIDWORKS or something like that, you will look at the von Mies stress or the maximum principal stress. So normally if that gets to what's known as the yield stress of the material, that's the point at which it starts to break. So it's a scalar measure of how close it is to breaking normally. Von Mies is normally for ductile materials. Um, so you can see here, if we look at that, um, oh, I need to rescale it, uh, the peak of the wave. Oh, get out of the way, please. Okay. Okay, there we go. So in this case, uh, you'll see you get a stress concentration. Um, let me rescale it again. Just down at the bottom corner. So it's where it's fixed. You get some stress concentrations down there. And then just under his chin, you get a little stress concentration. So if this is going to crack. In this mode, it would probably crack under his chin or, or where it's fixed at the bottom. You can also look at strain, which is a measure of like the deformation, where the material is being stretched the most. And you can also run the case. I think I ran it here. If you go into um, mechanical properties, you can change it to an elastoplastic, some knees plastic. At type of plasticity, you can change it to that. So in that case, I'm gonna say when this von Mies stress gets to a value of, um, I think it was one e to the four, I say that's the max stress it can withstand. Then it's gonna start permanently deforming. So if I uh, look at that case in comparison, uh, if we look at the stress, so the stress can't go above whatever the uh, maximum is. So. I think it's one e to the four. So in this case, this is elastoplastic. So when he bends back the first time, it kind of permanently deforms. deforms. So it, it dissipates energy. So then it'll just, whatever remaining elastic energy, it'll just bounce around that point kind of thing. Um, okay, since we started late, I shall keep going. Okay, question in the chat. Uh, yeah, so the question, oh, you can't see it. So the question is, is the point D displacement field uh, solved for the displacements of the points directly? And um, just like in dynamic mesh, or is it solved for the cell centers and then interpolated? For this particular solid model, it actually solves at the points. There's no interpolation. So, but there are ones that solve the cell centers and then interpolate to get a point D field. In this case, this vertex centered one really is solved at the points. Um, okay, now to do an example of an FSI case. How do I hide this thing? This one? Okay, we're leaving it there. Uh, so this case is the dam break case. We just have a flexible dam. So we just kind of have a little piece of rubber dam. Okay, so the equations in the fluid, um, we have your number Stokes equations, incompressible fluid, and we have this alpha equation. So solving for the phases, it's a multi-phase equation. So air and water. That's what the fluid solves. The solid is as before, but we have an extra set of equations. So for a fluid solid uh, problem, we have kinematic and kinetic conditions. So basically the, 
that this velocity at the interface of the fluid has to be equal to the solid. They can't be separate because then you'll get a hole which has nothing in it. Also, the kinetic ones basically say the force or traction at any point has to be equal and opposite. That's the idea. So they, that's what the coupling algorithm has to enforce. Um, so I said, there's two approaches, partitioned and monolithic. Uh, open foam uses, or solid to foam uses partitioned. Just a note on parallelization. Uh, the fluid gets decomposed into how many processes you have, and then the solid does, because they, they take turns. So if you have eight cores, it'll be eight on the fluid and eight in the solid. That might not be the most efficient if you have a small solid and a big fluid, um, but that's the way it works. And the interface is stored on all cores as well, just to facilitate the, the algorithm implementation. So the only difference then in this case between what we saw previously is now we have two regions. We have a fluid and a solid. So like before, we physics properties. In this case, it's fluid solid interaction. When it finds that, it will expect to find a fluid and solid subdirectory inside zero, inside constant, and inside system. So if you want to specify your fluid boundary conditions, they will be inside zero fluid, and then you'll have velocity vector. If you want to specify the solid, it'll be inside zero solid point B like before. So it's just like two cases in one and they're stored in subregions is how it works. This is like conjugate heat transfer. If you ever do that, that's the way they define the case setup. And there's FSI properties, which have details about the coupling algorithm that are used. Uh, in the next release as well, there's uh, Precise is an external software for coupling. So there, you've got the Precise adapter working with solid foam. So, um, I should be. I will add an example where it's solid for foam for the solid, and then a conventional open foam solver for the fluid. It's not using the FSI coupling of solid for foam. It's just a solid for foam solid, and then a black box to this external precise coupler. And um, just in case you're interested, so precise is a dedicated coupling software. So in this case, we have our like interfoam boundary condition for the fluid and um, um, and properties for in, inter uh, interfoam, and then the solid like before we have mechanical properties. The only thing to be aware of, it's not interfoam, it's interdiam foam because the fluid mesh will move. It, they all have to be ALE formulations, formulations. They all have to be dynamic mesh formulations for fluid solid interface. Uh, okay, the all run in this case will run block mesh on the solid, on the fluid, set the fields in the fluid. So that's the initial alpha field and then run the solver. So if I try that out, um, so I'm going to go back to solid interaction, flexible dam break. This thing is annoying the hell out of me. Uh, run all run. Uh, so that is running the case. If I just stop it and run solid foam, you'll see the solver running, uh, printing out time steps. Uh, let me see. I have the results here. So when I open this, if you're not familiar with multi-region cases, uh, in Paraview, it will see a fluid mesh and a solid mesh. So you could load each one individually. Uh, but there's a convenient filter in Paraview called extract blocks. So if I select on this here and I go, um, search extract or extract block so extract block uh, lets you say i want to take the fluid so i'm going to call this fluid then i select the original one again go filters recent extract block uh, solid and uh, why am i doing this it just means i can visualize or display different fields in the solid versus in the fluid um, so once again, the solid is a non-moving solid. This is a small strain one. So if I play this, um, if I turn off the solid for a second and I look at the alpha field in the fluid, you'll see, I set this to 2D, you'll see the fluid mesh updates. But if I actually look at the solid, the solid isn't actually moving at all because it's, it's calculating the deformation and that deformation is passed to the fluid, so the fluid updates, but it's doing its integral over a non-moving mesh. So it's doing the calculations on a non-moving mesh. So if you want to actually see the movement, you have to uh, uh, use the warp uh, by vector. You can also see it's a non-conformal mesh. 
So uh, there's different ways to map. It's using GGI or AMI to do the mapping in between, so the interpolation. So if I warp the vector by point D, and this point D is actually interpolated from D. So this is, is, is not sulfur. This is actually a cell-centered formulation. Um, and let's look at the displacement of the solid. So then if you visualize that, then you'll see it, it's, it aligns as expected. Okay, and then if you wanted to look at things like the von Mies stress, you'll see it's high at the front and at the back of where it's fixed. Where it's most constrained, that's where you get the highest stress. So if it's gonna break, it's gonna break at the bottom. And that's classic for bending problems. You have, if you bend something, it'll crack on the outside, not the inside. So, and I can see there's some questions in the chat. I'm gonna wait just till I finish because I'm almost finished and then I'll go to those. Uh, Yeah, just some comments on kind of future directions in sulfur foam. And um, I, I know this is a very short introduction, but maybe maybe you felt it's very long, in which case apologies, but uh, uh, I think it's short. Uh, so some kind of future directions, efficiency and robustness. So sulfur foam works on cases, but in some cases it's quite slow. In some cases it's not very robust. By robust, I mean the case explodes or doesn't convert very well. And um, this is generally a comment on FSI procedures anyway. And um, so efficiency, and uh, these new block coupled methods are probably one way to speed things up. And so that's where I'm focusing effort. And then robustness, uh, monolithic methods, maybe more long-term, but also linking external couplers, precise and other external couplers um, show better performance from benchmarks than the, in, the inbuilt coded ones. So that they're the sort of directions that we're going. Very good, that is the end of my talk. I'll share all these slides. I'll probably just put them all up on, uh, Research gate. I don't know what they do to recording. I'm happy for it to be put on YouTube, but I'll leave that to her for whatever they're going to do with it. So, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me while you're thinking about it. I'll answer. There's one question here in the uh, chat. So, um, uh, Anas asks, "Can you explain comparison in performance being vertex-centered and cell-centered?" Um, I'll try. So in terms of efficiency is in speed, in this case, the vertex centered is block coupled. So if you compare block coupled cell centered and vertex centered, they're the same speed, give or take. If you have a segregated, which is the standard or the default approach, generally that'll be slower. And in some cases, very thin structures, it'll be much slower, as in it could be a hundred times slower. And um, so, but that's block coupled. So that's a coupled solver versus a non-coupled solver. And um, so that's not really vertex centered versus cell centered. In terms of um, accuracy, they're pretty much the same. I'm gonna give a talk tomorrow and you'll see that the accuracy is pretty similar. It just depends on the actual discretization. And um, there are some convenient things. So um, for multi-material cases, if you have a piece of aluminum stuck to a piece of steel, then you get a discontinuity in the gradient of your solution field. So if you have a vertex centered method, you have a point right on the interface. So you don't have to uh, do anything special. You just, you add a contribution from the left and the right, and then that's it. In cell-centered, you have, you have a jump like in multi-phase, so you have to like do something special with the gradients. So there's some conveniences in that regard. Uh, the inconvenient thing is everything in open foam is written for cell-centered, so you have to rewrite everything yourself if you want to get a gradient. And another question online, uh, a really stupid question, would it work if I change the solid to a fluid with an infinite viscosity and positive spring constant? And yeah, there's, there's definitely ways to do it. I'm involved in a number of projects for additive manufacturing and to do a laser-based fusion. And then you have a solid and a fluid, and then you, the, solid, the fluid melts and turns into, or then solidifies and turns into a solid. In that case, the can, standard thing to do is model the solid as a very viscous fluid. So that, it depends on what your goal is. Um, it can, uh, infinity won't work in anything numerical, but yeah, I understand a, a very big value. Um, Another one, I'm new to salt foam. Uh, is it possible to use open foam and wave to foam? Um, yeah, um, yeah, the master branch works with waves to foam. I haven't tried it late, re recently, but yeah, it does work with waves to foam. Um, there's a guy from, who was in yeah, UCL, Lu Fang, Fang. He's in Luffer now, I think. And he's done a lot of stuff on modeling ice and stuff using waves to foam uh, and salt to foam. Uh, another question, for solid models, we have two options, nonlinear and uns nonlinear. 
and where owns is the class name unstructured. Um, yeah, so in solid models and solid foam, some of them have a prefix name that starts at uns, uns, and um, so um, it's a different discretization of the gradient of the face. So this comes from Jakob Djukovic. He came up with some methods where if you want to calculate the gradient of the face, there's a couple of ways to do that. One way is you calculate the cell center gradients and interpolate it. Another way is you directly at the face calculate the gradient using the surrounding values in some way. Or maybe just do the normal part by neighbor versus owner and then interpolate the rest of the gradient. So there's uns methods which have shown to be more accurate, uh, particularly on unstructured meshes. But no, all of them can be used for unstructured meshes. It's just maybe unses should be just called more accurate discretization, but it's more expensive. It's slower. Uh, okay, that's the online questions. Does anyone have any questions in the room? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, no, fundamental difference. So the question for people online is, what's the fundamental difference between the approach precise adopts and the approach that solves your foam adopts? So they're the same. So in fact, they we claim to implement the same algorithm uh, but theirs tends to perform better. <laughs> so, uh, so strongly coupled, loosely coupled, people have different words for what they mean by that. Typically, what, what they mean, I think, uh, is strongly coupled means you so go to a time step, solve fluid, solid fluid, solid, and you keep going until they converge to some tolerance. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know I've run cases and they, it's essentially the same thing. So that, that's very strong coupling. Uh, so it's the same idea. There are some subtle differences, no doubt, in the implementation. From benchmarks, it seems that uh, some of their implementations are, are, uh, show better convergence that I've seen. So that's one reason I want to include the adapter, so you have the option to, to use that. Uh, there's another question uh, just behind you. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Sure, so uh, there are some explicit solvers in Salzburg foam, but they, I would say they're more demonstrators, proof of concepts than a code that will, will work in most cases. And um, so yeah, I, I have set it up, this wobbly case will work. It's super slow because the time step is like one e to the minus 12 or something, but it, it will work. Um, but people who are focused on fast dynamics, there's a group that are originated in Swansea. And so Antonio Gill, uh, Javier Bonnet, uh, a few other guys like that. Um, they, I, I, that, and they're using open foam as well now. Uh, there's a guy, Gibram Hader, I think he comes along to these sometimes. So they are implementing fully explicit Riemann solver, uh, final volume solver mechanics methods for large strains. So they do like very similar to compressible flow. You have these Riemann solvers where you, you assume, it's kind of like a different flavor of final volume cell standard. You assume there's a discontinuity at every face and then you r resolve that as a propagator around. And um, so yeah, that's for fast dynamics, that's fine. Um, explicit solvers, if it's not a sh quick problem, they're slow. I mean, if it's longer than one second, you're going to have to do a billion times steps to, to do it. But, uh, but they're robust. So if, you, if you're BMW, you do a car crash simulation, find element, it's going to be explicit because it works. So, so that's not a focus that I've focused on in solid foam. There are examples that will work. But yeah, there are those uh, codes that I, they've publicly shared some of them from Swansea in open foam. They, they will, they will, uh, they're really focusing on that. Yeah, thanks. With compressible flow. Not not really. I mean, you can do it. The missing piece is like the temperature equation. I haven't set up coupling for that. So that that's maybe another reason for precise, then you can have your coupling of that as well. So if you need the temperature equation, that that isn't in the interface at the moment. Uh, but uh, you there are solids that solve for temperature. So then if, as long as you have a coupler that uh, allows for that. Um, so there is, for FSI cases, for incompressible cases, sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of compressibility because it helps convergence. So like in arteries or something. So there's like these weakly compressible solvers, like uh, I guess, uh, not like sonic foam, I guess, was, is kind of weakly compressible. So there is uh, weakly compressible ones, but it, they're basically incompressible. It's just it improves convergence for FSI cases with a bit of uh, compressibility. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, there's no reason you can't do it. It's just, it depends, you, I guess, for if it's like real central foam, then you, you, I guess you need the temperature field or enthalpy field or something. You can't ignore that unless you have a really well insulated solid. 
Uh, well, maybe you can, maybe you can. But yeah, no, no, it, the, the overall general approach still works, yeah. Sure. This is partitioned, so solid solid, solid fluid are independent and you just exchange information. Monolithic essentially one solver and you have one matrix and the discretization has to be, uh, it's more challenging to implement. I mean, it has actually been demonstrated in open form. Uh, there's a Green Shields Ivankovic paper from 99, there's one in 2004, they demonstrated it. And I have some version of that code, it doesn't work very well, so. Not that it won't work very well. It's they were using a segregated algorithm. You get pressure jumps at the interface. They didn't sort all of that stuff out. So it can work. It will work. It's just take some projects and people take some painful PhD years to get it working well. FSI and Phoenix. So I I've done a tutorial in Phoenix and then I forgot how to use it and haven't used it since. But Phoenix, um, does, does that have, I know it does solids, but does that do FSI in Phoenix itself? And is it a monolithic or partition? Do you know? I, I don't know. Okay, yeah, sure. So ComSol is, uh, it's fine in element anyway, that's one distinction. Uh, so uh, that's fine. It works for fluids. There are some uh, differences in fluid mechanics in, in fine element, obviously. Some messing around with convection terms and stuff. And so that's fine. So no, it's, a, I mean, it's fundamentally the same thing. Uh, monolithic, that's monolithic independent of finding on the front line. So I don't know the details of their solver. Maybe you've experienced with it. You can say if it's good enough. You're, okay, okay, okay. I don't, I don't know then, yeah. You try it out and come back in two years and tell us if it's good or bad then. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for the most of the solids and solids form are implicit. So that means they're condition they're unconditionally stable. So they're independent of the current number in terms of uh, stability. Some material models will be time dependent, like plasticity. So then there is an accuracy. If you don't have a small time step, then you're, it's less accurate. So there isn't a condition on them. The explicit solvers will, you have a current number, you need to keep the current number less than one or probably less than like 0.5 or something like that. Um, in terms of FSI though, one thing people like to have is a different time step for the solid and the fluid. That's not implemented. And um, so that's a bit annoying. So I think I think Precise can do that. I'm not sure. I think Precise lets you have different time steps, uh, but I, not in solid form at the moment. If that answers your question. Sorry, I forgot I'm, I'm not repeating the questions for online people anymore, apologies. Any other questions? Yep, yeah, please. So for a multi-phase, like if you've interfoam, then it's they're independent because it's partitioned. It's just an interfoam case and a solid case. So any boundary condition you can use in interfoam, you can use in like interfluid in solid foam. So I, I'm not I'm not so familiar with them, but is there, there's like a constant angle one and something else. So you can use uh, you can use you can use all of those. And that's what, it's just the only thing you need is the force. So the interface just needs the force, which is just like pressure plus viscous stress or whatever. So uh, the alpha equation it doesn't really matter. So the this is not my area, but I think the Neumann triangle is like when you have a, like two two solids and then a fluid. Is it or, or what is it? It's like yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean as long as the boundary condition on the solid is there, or the boundary condition on the fluid on the interface, like from the fluid side, as long as the boundary condition is correct for the uh, surface tension or whatever, then that can be captured. Yeah, it should work. It, like that's independent of the solid. The only thing the fluid needs from the solid is its geometry. So it gets that and that just comes by the mesh. So you can do whatever you want with boundary conditions, give or take, except for force, it has to be enforced. Well, not, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I'm probably not understanding it fully, but we can chat afterwards uh, if, if that helps. Any other questions? I'm, I'm going to be around for uh, the rest of the, until Thursday anyway, so we can always chat more. I guess people want to go get a coffee. Okay, cool.
Yeah, okay. There should be ones, there is like beam and, what, what do you mean moving? Oh, oh, I understand, I understand. Probably not, but yeah, let's let's chat about it. And then you can tell me what you want and I'll tell you how difficult it's set it up there. Okay, thanks so much. <laughs>